I think we're going to take some time and open up the floor to questions. Go ahead. You know, preparing for the uh, step one, I'm sure you probably had some sort of crazy, amazing way to score the way you did. Uh, can you share a little bit about what you did on how to prepare for step one? Yeah, so, I mean, when you get in the system and you're surrounded by other students who are, you know, drooling at the opportunity to kill the step one and you've got this network, all the hints and tip, tip strategies and everything, you'll know them all, right? Like, when you get there, you'll know them all. And for me in particular, I just listened to like, what sounded like good advice. I, from day one, I worked hard. If you study hard, each unit in SABA is designed for the USMLE one. Like, you're literally studying for that test from day one. And so if you're putting your, your time in, you're getting top grades, you're gonna kill that exam. You're gonna know on the practice exam, when you kill the practice exam, that yeah, I'm pretty prepared. So all those steps along the way, you're ready. And I knew, like there's, there's you can even download online, like from the NBME, practice exams and simulated, and it'll tell you, okay, if you get this score on the practice exam, it's similar to this on the real. So I knew I was gonna kill that exam, and it was as a result of, you know, just, it wasn't overnight, it was not cramming, it was two years on that island of preparation, and that was it, there's no secret. Thank Other, you. Other questions? Yes. In regards to step exams for US and Canada, I saw that you have both. How different are they, and how did you prepare for both at the same time? So the content is v very similar. Actually, the USMLE one and the MCEE one, which if you're an international graduate, you have to write, and then the Canadian graduates also have to write the QE one. Those three exams is all the same content. So the best idea is when you're writing one, you kind of schedule the other, and then you're uh, killing two birds with one, three birds with one stone. And then when you uh, are in residency and you're writing the USMLE two and the MCQE two. Again, they're both clinical exams and same content. When you when you prepare, like you'll you'll learn that there is some subtle differences, but because you know it's all medicine, it's all the same topic, it's the same stuff. You'll the subtle differences aren't really that big. I've asked our dean of uh, clinicals, uh, Dr. Elias Dam. I said to him, you know, gee, you know, do we have any stats on MCC pass rates, etc.? And he said, you know, we're not required to take them. But he said, you know. I've been here like eight years. I don't think anyone who's ever passed the USMLE has not passed the MCCE um, because the two just overlap so well and you just grind so hard for one. And the MCC is a shorter exam, it's more concise, it's more focused. So that's generally what to expect. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? So basically, I just want to know how Saba has been very different or unique in preparing you and in coaching you and, and you know, setting you on the journey. So how is Seba unique? It gave me the opportunity that I needed to do what I needed to do. I mean, it was a great island. I had a great life experience there, and I look back fondly at like, man, I was living on a tropical paradise. I was in the library all the time, but I was living there. And, um, and that was great. And then in the clinical electives, they kind of gave me the freedom to do what I needed to do. Like I knew early I wanted surgery, so you know, I kind of booked my surgical electives at uh, you know, the best places I could go. And then when I had my like the selectives where I could choose to go. I went to like, you know, wherever was the best place. I went to Mayo Clinic in Minnesota and they helped me, you know, facilitate all that. Yes. Just in terms you're talking about, because I remember all the places that I'm sure everybody here has applied different places. What do you think Saba saw in you that these other schools didn't? You know, I, they, we, we did an interview on the phone. I'll never forget it because like uh, they did a phone interview and it was like a really, you know, nice process and they were like so enthusiastic and they were so pumped and like they were pumped about my grades and they were pumped about my MCATs because I was like right on the cutoffs. But like they were positive about me and I think I needed to hear that. Like, like I was kind of in a very down place because you know, you, I was waitlisted two years in a row. I was doing a master's I didn't want to be doing. I was not, I felt like my dream was like fading in the distance. And it was, I get on this phone interview and they're like, like so excited. Like, yeah, I think Sabre would be a great fit. We're gonna let you know, but like, you know, you got a great application. And it was like, made me feel really good about myself because, you know, maybe I was being super hard on myself, um, you know, for not being good enough when I really was. It's just, I think the reality is in Canada here that, you know, the, the entrance requirements are so tough and there's so few spots and it's such a closed system that good applicants don't make it in. You mentioned that one of your mentors you talked to in Toronto um, was giving you some special pointers on how to get a residency in Toronto. Um, so what were those special pointers? Or is there anything that you need to do other than just get your marks really high and your Canadian examinations really high to get a residency in Toronto, a competitive one? Most of it's, like, like you said already, 
it's common stuff that you already know, is doing the best on your, all those licensing exams that I wrote, getting the best marks in med school, and that's like very concrete objective. And so you want a competitive residency, so what do you gotta do? Number one, you gotta work with the people that are making those decisions. So you want plastic surgery in Toronto, you gotta work with the plastic surgeons in Toronto who and make those decisions. Or if you want derma, like dermatology in Alberta, you gotta work with the dermatologist who makes that decision. So how do you do that? You um, arrange an elective with them, or you contact them and say, you know, I'm so-and-so, I'd like to do a research project. So that's kind of cool, that research um, elective time that they do. That's extremely important because nowadays, when you're a medical student, um, you know, I've sat on the admissions board for plastic surgery, you know, it's 25% of your application score is research. And so, you know, what you want to do is get involved in research and publications early. You don't necessarily have to, like, you know, complete a PhD or, you know, write something in nature, but you have to have some kind of research background. And so to, to, to put that all together, your application is going to have, you know, top marks, top um, uh, grades in your medical school class, the top marks is on the licensing exams, some research component, and then the final piece of the puzzle is working with the people who make the decision. And then when you work with those people, you better be good. <laughs> like, you better, like, like, you better know the topic. Like, it, I mean, it goes unsaid, but. Well, I'd like, like to thank all of you for coming. Let's hear it for Dr. John Carlo. Thank you.